Do you have trouble concentrating or doing a task until it's completed? It's possible, possible you have ADHD. So what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And why are so many adults now being diagnosed with it? Hello and welcome to Roundtable, I'm Enda Brady. Now, the number of adults finding out they have ADHD is outstripping diagnoses for children. What are the underlying reasons? Roundtable's Jen Carswell has been looking into the numbers. In the UK, ADHD affects three to four people in every 100. So we're talking about millions of people. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder means those who've been diagnosed have challenges with inattention, so finding it hard to concentrate, hyperactivity, so feeling restless and struggling to sit still, and impulsivity, doing things without really thinking about the consequences. It's classified as a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it affects brain functions, so it can impact learning, communication, movement, emotions, and attention. Who has ADHD depends on genetics, meaning some people are more prone to the disorder, and environmental factors like birth complications or exposure to toxins can also play a role. ADHD is often diagnosed in childhood. That's because the symptoms become evident when kids start school. Boys and men are more likely to be diagnosed, again, because the symptoms tend to become more obvious. But it doesn't just affect children. A recent study found a 50% increase in ADHD prescriptions for men aged 18 to 29 between the years 2000 and 2008. Referrals for diagnoses are also sharply up. Experts point to two possible explanations. One is there's more awareness of ADHD. The other is the COVID-19 pandemic when working and educational environments changed, which may have made ADHD behaviors more noticeable. But ADHD is not all bad. There are positive qualities too. Hyperfocus, for one, means people are very knowledgeable and productive when it comes to things that they're passionate about, while others with ADHD find that they perform extremely well in a crisis when the situation demands their full attention. And then there's increased creativity. A tendency to get distracted can mean exploring an alternative and unique solution to a problem. Being different can be a benefit, and variety is the spice of life, after all. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining us from Litchfield in the UK is Emma Kenny. She's a psychologist and TV presenter. I'm delighted to say that here with me in the studio is Simon Blair, a business owner, ultra-marathon runner, and someone who's recently been diagnosed with ADHD. And Dr Judith Mooring is a psychiatrist and one of the UK's leading experts on ADHD. Simon, I'll come to you first. We are long-standing friends. We We've are. run together. We've known each other a long time. Yep. I've always thought of you as someone with great levels of energy. And then you go and tell me that in your 40s, you've been diagnosed with ADHD. How did this make you feel? Um, well, I think I'd always realised there was something going on when I was younger. Um, and as I got older, some of the frustrations started to come to the forefront. So I thought I'd just get it checked out. I was having therapy. My therapist said, get tested. So I thought, let's do it. And I did. So you, you've now got the diagnosis? Well, I was diagnosed. Um, I mean, the truth is, I, I, as I say, I was always aware that it was, it was present. Um, and it was really a confirmation of something that, that was, was almost, um, almost a positive. So I got tested about a year and a half ago, came back hitting all the triggers. Um, and then I had options about what I could do um, about addressing it. You know, would I take, uh, would, I, would I do nothing? Um, or would I um, take some kind of drugs to help me along? And actually I decided to do nothing because I actually don't have an issue with it. I just want to understand myself and what makes me, me. Was there relief when you got the diagnosis? Um, I think, I wouldn't say, I, I would, do you know what? I would say there was relief, um, in particular of understanding the past. So some of the issues I had as a child to do with learning and attention, suddenly it all made sense. And so, yet you're a super successful business person. Every race that you enter, you do really well running. I mean, you're a highly functioning person. Well, I've learned, I think I've learned to, I'm, I'm one of the very lucky ones who's learned how to drive some of the issues that come from ADHD in a certain direction. So sport, for example, to me, and using energy 
exerting energy through, particularly through cricket in my youth and rugby, um, and now running. And the only reason I don't do those sports anymore is because of my, my children. I don't have time. I, I have always gravitated towards physical exertion that means that I just use that energy and I just feel emotionally better as a result at the back end. So it creates a chemical reaction that I've really kind of been drawn towards and I want more of that. Judith, are we seeing more adults getting this diagnosis? Yes, we are. Um, and I think it's a really good thing, as Simon was saying, because um, people are recognising it more. There's more awareness because obviously the internet, TikTok, etc., is full of memes about ADHD and neurodiversity. So I think that's really, really positive. And adults are waking up to the fact that you can be different. I have a diagnosis of ADHD as well. So you can be different and it can be a strength as well as a difficulty. So I think, you know, particularly I work with lots of um, entrepreneurs like Simon and lots of businesses. And you see the strengths of ADHD very much channeled into using that energy, that creativity, that drive. So, yeah. And, and just tell me your diagnosis. Yeah. What age were you, if you don't mind me asking? I was 45 and I was halfway through assessing a client for ADHD and I realised I had ADHD. And it was a real mic drop moment for me. It was very difficult to manage in the session because I had to not kind of reveal this to the poor client. Um, but there was a sudden penny drop going, oh, that's who I am. Crikey. Mm. So there's a spectrum of ADHD traits and um, some of us will have some and some of us will have many. Uh, and for some people, it can be really problematic and for others less so. Let's bring Emma in. Emma, what do you make of Simon and Judith's stories, both with ADHD and both living really busy lives and managing it? Well, I don't want to be discompassionate in any way because everybody's story is important. Everybody's story is subjective. I think there's a massive overdiagnosis of ADHD. I think it's being treated often with drugs that have got real big issues. And I think there's a real motive behind why we're overdiagnosing. I also think there's a horrendous scenario where everyone wants to become a homogenous group, as opposed to seeing that they're unbelievably unique human beings. And it's our quirks and idiosyncrasies that often are now being diagnosed into these positions and groups. And therapeutically, I don't really think it's a positive thing. And again, that isn't to try to disrespect everyone or anyone. It's just saying that TikTok, for example, is created, in my opinion, tiktochondria where you self-diagnose everything and everybody wants a label. And I don't think that's good for our mental health. And I certainly don't think it's good for children or adults indeed in this case. That's my opinion. I'm not saying that people aren't allowed their story. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, as I said, just to bring in a counter narrative. In my experience, having worked with some of the most problematic individuals growing up with big problems for many, many, many years and watching how it was a systematic opportunity to be lumped into these groups by particular professionals as opposed to recognizing trauma and experience from childhood that had become very indicative of why they were the way that they were and they become adults so that's why i have this position emma do you think social media is playing a big role now then yes i know it is the research evidence is it is you'd have to be somebody who had no experience with seeing just how shall we say, a viral mimetic infection, the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins came up with that. It's very, very appropriate to discuss that in that manner. It means that a thought becomes, a belief becomes who you are. And it infects every cell on social media that is more evident than ever. And we can see that with the higher diagnosis of DID, which is incredibly rare, but is massive online. We can see it with autism, which again, is not very typical in the actual experience on a day-to-day -day level of normal, typical human beings and, neuro, you know, the neurodiversity that we see, it's growing because people are seeking belongingness. They're seeking answers to bigger questions. The answers to the bigger questions don't lie in different diagnosis. They lie in self-acceptance and the uniqueness of self-acceptance. In my opinion, like I said, in my opinion, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody here. Judith, I'll just come back to you on what Emma just said. Uh, how do you feel hearing that? So, I'm... Um, sort of less interested in how I feel, but more interested in the reality, which is that about one in four people is neurodivergent, and that's what the evidence says. So it's great to have an opinion, but the reality and the evidence says that about one in four people is neurodivergent. And I think it's important that we don't think that our experienced professionals invalidates what our clients are telling us. So I've got masses of experience of working everywhere from Holloway to Harley Street. I see profound levels of neurodiversity in the mentally unwell population. It's there. And we know it is. Um, so I think it's important not to invalidate people's experience. Yes, there are people who are overdiagnosed, and yes, there are definitely links with trauma. 
and yes, you can say that there is a spectrum of, tra of traits in the population. We can say that using the genetic evidence. But I think it's wrong to just say my position is this, therefore I, I invalidate right. and discount what my clients are saying, because the clients are what's, what's at the heart of this. And really just tell are. me, social media, do you have concerns about the amount of children on it finding out about ADHD or thinking they've got ADHD when they haven't? I have more concerns about other things on social media than ADHD, because the truth is that if you think you've got ADHD, you're going to be waiting forever for a diagnosis anyway on the NHS. So the chances of being overdiagnosed and overtreated are zero. I'm actually more concerned about other issues like self-harm memes on ADA, on, on um, social, social media. media. Yeah. yeah. So, just back, back to you, Emma. I, um, I'm sure you just want to come back on that. Well, I, if you want to say that I've invalidated my client's experience whilst not saying anything about anybody's client's experience, apart from suggesting that I think that as human beings, we have a subjective experience of not wanting to be disrespectful to anybody. Having said that, it is massively diagnosed incorrectly in lots of circumstances. When you look at the states, which is something we're following, you have enormous amounts of people who are now on drugs that have big problems and it's not actually solving the problems. So if you were saying facts, so to also bring in the idea that you just suggested that it's a fact, the reason all we've seen scientifically is people saying what facts are. And it's turned out to be fiction. So I'm sorry, you can't just say the evidence is this, but then there's this spectrum and it's an enormous spectrum. What we have to do is say people are in pain and people are getting medicated and people are being diagnosed and many are being seen by professionals and it's not working. So initially it might make somebody feel that they've got something that makes them have a sense of why they are the way they are. But unless that has an impact on their happiness levels and their experience levels and their output levels and all the things that go with that, there's a problem. And if we don't bring in the fact that there's been a whole pressure where psychiatry is concerned regarding drugs, et cetera, and the use of medications, it would just be untrue not to acknowledge that. Thanks, Emma. Simon, you've decided to raise awareness of ADHD through your running. Yes. There is one of the toughest races in the world yep. that takes place every year in the, the Saharan Desert yes. in Morocco, Marathon de Sable. It's, what, 250 kilometres over six or seven days? That's right, six days, yes. And you've just completed it. Yeah. Um, we can watch some footage of you and your running. It was important for you to do this, wasn't it? You'd, you'd failed the first time? Well, I, so I went to do it in 2021. Um, and I've taken part in a lot of these races in the past um, and I was one of those people who thought that I could you know, conquer everything that I took part in. But then uh, an, a lot of things went wrong at the same time for that event, which led to me not being successful. Um, so I had to go back and it was the best thing I ever did to do that. And just talk to me about the documentary you're making now. So you've had a camera crew follow you around and yeah, you're talking yeah, yeah. about your diagnosis. So a few months beforehand, camera crew was with me and my family and um, just, you know, getting a good flavour of my attitude towards the race um, and my ADHD diagnosis. Um, and then they were with me all the way through the running. So I had, you know, um, I had cameras everywhere and things zipping down while I was running in the Sahara. It was, it was profound and weird and wonderful um, all at once. Um, and then afterwards, following me around a bit just to, just to kind of finish it off. So the film will come out in August. Um, it's about turning failure into success, but it's really a platform to open a dialogue about ADHD. I mean, listening to some of the comments on here, look, I, I think labels are probably, probably are being thrown around a lot on a number of levels, but there's no doubt that people have got a different kind of mental way of thinking. Um, and there are autism and ADHD and probably many, many other forms of, of, of that kind of mental thought process. But to, to give people the ability to understand themselves more by talking about it, even though it doesn't hit kind of like the, the norm, the normal um, way of thinking of the past is no bad thing. Um, is, is, are the drugs a good thing? Probably not um, overall. You know, they can be taken too much, but in this country, I don't think that's anywhere near as much of a problem as in the States, for example. But at the moment, we want to have a platform for people to discuss things, and hopefully that will improve mental health issues in the past. Um, you know, and in the long term, hopefully people, less people commit suicide and in the worst instance. Now, whatever it takes to get that, that conversation going is a good thing. And tell Labels me, Simon, or not. you've had a lot of people approach you. You're very active on Instagram. You talk yeah. very frankly and honestly. Yeah. What have people been saying to you, the feedback? Um, I mean, I, look, I've used, I've used the whole experience as a bit of self-therapy to some degree. 
But the, the reaction's been unbelievably positive. I mean, 40, 50 people have reached out separately to talk to me about their situation. And I've tried to give them all the time of day. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at the reaction that even the lead up on social media to a film that hasn't even come out yet in August has had. And therefore, if it helps one person, it's done something good. Judith, do you think there needs to be more awareness? People like Simon talking frankly about their experiences and how they feel and maybe what people should be doing? I think there's definitely a place for education. Um, education about mental health, education about therapy, education about medication, because my whole thing is that there is no one simple solution to mental health. Mental health is really complex. Human experience is really complex. So we need to be able to bring all of those things in together, education, medication, therapy, so that people have... Uh, exposure to all the different points of view, which is why something like this, where we've got different points of view, is so important, because people are different. And that's what neurodiversity is about. It's about saying people really are different, and they can be very, very different in how they experience the world. And it's important we recognise that. So, yeah, loads more education, definitely. Emma, bring you back in. More education needed, Judith says. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with what either person has just said in those particular conversations. I think my thing is that I think that every single human being is incredibly diverse. And sometimes, because of the system and the way that we bring children up, basically fitting into this very monolithic system, and I worked with young people for two decades who couldn't do that, my thing is to help people realise that it's not the human being that often is the issue. It's the places we put them that become the problem. And when you break out from that and you help people therapeutically understand that they can't be defined or they shouldn't wish to be classified a lot of the time because they are unique. And also when you help them to understand what they put in their body, what they do to their body, how they exercise their body and these things, that on an educational level, I think is profound. And whilst I do think, of course, social media has opened up so many amazing avenues for connectedness, it's also got some real endemic problems that we have to challenge. But even though we have different points of view, I think that for the most part, I agree with what's been said. I just don't agree with this idea of people wanting to see themselves potentially as a label to answer questions that are far bigger, if that makes sense. But arguably right now, there's no funding for the actual work that would need to take place in the system they have to fit into. Unfortunately, it's the system that exists. And until that's challenged, I guess that these conversations will continue because there is no finite answer. Simon, what reaction have you had from family and friends, people who've known you a very long time? Um, I think they, look, they, they're happy that I'm exploring some things that are giving me answers to my past. You know, and, and I'm doing this as, a, as an effort towards self-driving my own understanding for myself. The stuff that's come out the side of that is different. That's just happened as a reaction. Yeah. But I think one of the things I, I would say is that, you know, people in this day and age, the new normal, um, is is ADHD, autism, whatever it is? They're all versions of normal. There's no. I actually agree um, with that. I think I think that to label things as you know too too much that way or that way is, is incorrect. I think that we are all perfectly fine. There's just different versions and ways of thinking. So um, my family and friends have done nothing but be supportive, and I think that the people that I know who are connected via social media have just gravitated towards it. People want the platform to discuss this. Now, whether you agree that side or that side, people are ready to talk more about this subject. And the more we can talk about it, the more we can understand it. And the more we can understand it, the more we can actually come up with the correct treatment of it in the future. Whether that, you know, I, I don't think ADHD is a bad thing. I think, I think ADHD is just another thing. It's do, just, do you feel like it's your superpower? I, sometimes it's, I mean, it's got terrible parts to it. But, you know, I think the stuff to do with upbringing, you know, and memory and um, retention of information... I mean, I can't remember my children's date of births, for example. It just never sticks. But, however, these days, my treatment of pressure and stress in particular, how I act when I'm in a state of reaction, whether it's negative... I mean, in my case, I react most positively when I'm in a, in a negative state. So when my back's against the wall, recessions, you know, my bi the way I run my businesses, if things are going well, I tend to drift off and be a bit useless. You know, if things are going badly or well, I tend to rise to the top and... I lead people, you know, but um, I, I'm just not in control of when that happens. And it's not endless either. Like these periods of hyper-focus, when they go, sometimes they last for weeks and months, but when they pass me by, I'm absolutely exhausted by the end of it. And it takes me quite a long time to get myself back on track. 
which is why I need holidays, and which is actually why I ultra run, because they're like holidays for my brain, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> Judith, what's the level of support like in the UK, National Health Service, if a young person gets an ADHD diagnosis? What happens next? Uh, so, sadly, there isn't enough resource in mental health at all. The reason that I teach is because there's one psychiatrist for every 12,500 people with a common mental health condition. It's exactly what Emma's saying. There's just not enough resource. Um, but the NICE guidance is reasonably clear that there should be a diagnosis by a trained professional that takes time, and I teach this to doctors, you have to take time, you can't rush it, you, mustn't make sure, you must make sure you don't miss things. And then there should be an offer, firstly, of education, actually. Mm. Ideally, in a group setting, you want group-based education. It's really hard to get that. It's hard to get good quality group-based education. Uh, and then if people want medication, that should be available if that's what they want. So very kind of client-focused, and, and the NICE guidance is reasonably clear on that. Um, we would love to see more training in schools as well, and more kind of neuro-inclusive workplaces and neuro-inclusive universities where we can create an inclusive environment for everybody. Simon, just on that point, do you think there's enough support out there for people? Look, in my limited experience um, with my circumstances, and one of my children has been diagnosed with ADHD, always aware of the label point as well, because I don't want them to be labelled either. I want them to have the best chance that they can have. Um, what I can say about my diagnosis is that the, the offering of drugs was there and I was very quick to not take that up. I, I'm very comfortable with myself. I like who I am. I, I, I can't say I'm not intrigued by the impact of it, but uh, as I say, I'm happy. But when it comes to the kids, um, I've seen no evidence at all to, say, to support that there's enough information out there coming from the schools um, to educate the parents or even the rest of the teachers in those schools as to what ADHD or autism or any uh, kind of variation of uh, a, a, what might, one might call a normal mindset might be. I've seen nothing to support that. And I think there's clearly an issue there. So the education piece at ground roots level, are not just to the children, but around the children. So the, the, the parents, the teachers, anyone who's in contact with, with those, those pupils. I think there's, you know, we're right. We're really at the early stages of that. It's got a long way to go. Emma, talk to us about the state of treatment for mental health issues in the National Health Service in the UK right now. It's not great, is it? No, I mean, I don't want to be negative about the NHS because we're very lucky compared to a lot of places. But understandably, the funding, and this is across the board, and it's been for decades, has been really low where mental health is concerned. So it's not comparable to other treatments. And the problem there is you have more and more people who are struggling and suffering and you have less and less capacity to deal with those. And arguably, that means that people who are working in the NHS, psychologists, psychiatrists, cognitive behavioural therapists, they're working with the more extreme cases. But of course, that then denies all those other human beings who are struggling with lots of different experiences and realities who can't receive the support because it's a genuine crisis met model to some degree. It'd be wonderful to have a lot more money put into it, but I'm not sure where we terms, we're talking about terms like ADHD or spectrum disorders. I'm not sure how much impact helping the individual would have therapeutically because it's the system essentially that's the real problem because I worked with young boys who at four years of age were thrown out of school and never got put back into mainstream school because their lives were really problematic. Their parents were really problematic. Their diets were really problematic. They weren't problematic. They were a reaction. They were a symptom of their environment. And unfortunately, when you extend that to the system, it's exactly what's just been talked about there. We almost need to go in and reshape that so that people who are normal, which is everybody to some degree, we're all normal, shades of normal, just whatever normal is can never be defined, can thrive. The system doesn't allow that. You sit children in seats at five years old and say, listen, and unfortunately, it just doesn't work, particularly where boys are concerned. And thus begins the trajectory. And that's before we add on economic, sociological, parental, diet related, exercise based issues, all corroborating that whole cycle of problematic failure that is systemic in our system, not because the child is failing or the adult they become is failing, but because we failed very early on to understand the gravity of trying to fit into those places and spaces as normal human beings. Judith, are companies doing enough, do you think? Gosh, I think leading on from what Emma was saying about systems, I think companies where there is the resource are understanding that systems can change in-house to some extent with the kind of universal design so that basically there's a space for everybody and there's flexibility in job design which can make a massive difference. And companies also invest a lot in education. So that's now my main job is to go into businesses and teach them about 
uh, mental health in all of its sort of uh, different nuances. Um, I think in some ways companies are kind of leading the charge here and I think the NHS is slightly behind. Wow. Uh, yeah, so the public sector, I know um, there's a big issue around traumatised doctors, around traumatised nurses, especially post-pandemic. Massive rates of PTSD and tra traumatic experiences because of the pandemic. Um, and we've got these really big public sector employers that don't have a resource to support their employees. So. Simon, what advice would you give to anyone watching who perhaps thinks they have ADHD or is a parent of a child who worries? What would you say to them? Uh, don't be frightened of it, embrace it and try and understand what that means for that child um, or for that individual. Um, it's the best thing you could ever imagine to have if you can not be fearful of some of the downsides of it. You know, they, you know as, I, as I've mentioned, the downsides can be traumatic because it means that you can't do certain things um, that other people can. But I think the, the upsides are significantly better. And we're, as, you know, as Emma says, we're all different and that, that should be embraced. But I would say people just need to talk as much as humanly possible and definitely don't try and fudge anything. Anything to do with mental health um, must be discussed at as much length as possible just to avoid whichever side of this you come at, at this from. It needs to be discussed as much as possible because the more we can do that, the more you can make young people feel that they are, they are they're fine, you know, and actually they can be the very best that they can be. But saying nothing and letting them suffer in silence on any level of, of mental health issues is, is not the answer. And unfortunately, that's still very much where we're, where we're at. Simon, Judith and Emma, thank you all so much for your input and analysis. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see there, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.